Hi, my name is Jesse, and I serve here at Real Life Church as one of the pastors. And I want to take a moment before we jump into the message to say thank you for engaging with us. We believe that this message is going to lift up your faith and lead you to encounter God through His Word. If you haven't already, we would love for you to take a second and subscribe to our YouTube channel. This way you can stay engaged and up to date on the latest message and it helps us get the message of the gospel out to others. Again, thank you so much for joining us from Sacramento and beyond and we trust that you will be blessed by the message today. To the word. We got a lot of word and a little bit of time, so we're going to get into it. If you have your Bibles, you can go to Acts chapter 3. Uh, as always, want to greet our online audience, those who are worshiping online. If you want the notes for today's message, you can go to the Bible app, select events, Real Life Church, and you will see the notes there for this message. We are continuing our series on supernatural leadership, supernatural leadership. Uh, you know, if I got to be honest with you, leadership is kind of a, a word I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm done with. Like, it's just like, man, this word is, we use it so much in our culture uh, everyone has a podcast about how great their leadership is and how terrible everyone else's leadership is. Leadership is like the buzzword, I feel like, of the last 15 years, uh, especially in the church. But the reality is we could all uh, tell a story about a poor leader that we have encountered, a bad leadership experience that we have had. And I'm not saying just outside of the church, but probably even in the church. And so we cannot deny this principle of leadership. And so today, my assignment is for us, as we look at supernatural leadership, that we would be able to see what does it look like to identify, but also to be a leader that operates in the supernatural. A leader who is not operating off their own intellect, wisdom, and knowledge, but that is operating through only what can come from having an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. A leader that is operating based on the revelation that can only come from God. I want to ask you, uh, has anyone ever learned something from somebody else that you didn't have to experience yourself? You learned from somebody else's life. Like how many of you could raise your hand right now where you've never had to put your hand on a hot stove? Can you raise your hand? You never had to put your hand on a hot stove. You know why? Because you learn from somebody else's mistake that that stove is hot. You might not even know who you need to thank because it might not even be your parents. It might have been their random uncle from years ago who taught them the wisdom you should not put your hand on the hot stove. Anyone got any older siblings in the house? Your younger sibling? Yeah, you learned from your older siblings on how not to talk to mom or dad. You learned very quickly. Hopefully you learned that lesson and applied it that that is not the way I should talk to mom unless I'm trying to be crazy. What we're going to do today is we're going to look at a supernatural leader in Peter in Acts chapter 3. And my hope is that we would be able to learn from his life and leadership so that we don't have to experience something or go the long route. But in fact, learning from someone else's life can be a shortcut for you and I. And I believe God gave us people in the Bible to help us in our growth and development. And today it's in the context of leadership. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1, it says this, one day... Peter and John were going up to the temple uh, at the time of prayer. It was about three in the afternoon. Please make note of that, three in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg for those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Can I just pause and say this? The beggar always wants a hand out, but God wants to give you a hand up. Go, going to verse 6. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the hand, and they helped him, in, uh, helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping around and praising God. When all of the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. 
and they were filled with wonder and amazement of what had happened to him. Verse 11, while the man held on Peter and John, all people were astonished and came running to them in this place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? Going down a little bit in verse 19, when Peter's addressing the crowd, he would go on to say, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Holy Spirit, we just pray and ask that you would be with us. We pray that you would help us to learn from the life of Peter. We hope that as we dive into your word, that you would give us revelation and you would give us courage and strength to apply that revelation to our lives. Help us, God, despite whatever our history with leaders and leadership is, help us today to understand what it is to be a supernatural leader. And all God's people said, amen. Title of this message is The DNA of a Supernatural Leader. The DNA of a Supernatural Leader. Now, what is the function of DNA? I have a definition for us for today. DNA is that which carries the genetic instructions used in growth, development, functioning, and reproduction of all known living organisms. In other words, DNA is the vehicle that is bringing all the information that is going to put together all living organisms. DNA is that thing that is going to say, this child is going to have brown eyes and wavy hair, or it's going to be this tall or this short. It is DNA that is the vessel that is carrying all the information needed for growth, for development, for functioning, and for reproduction. So, we are going to be investigating the DNA of a supernatural leader, hopefully that we can glean from that DNA and apply it to our lives, that we can apply that supernatural DNA to you and I on the regular. Now, you might be here and say, well, pastor, I'm not a leader, so I don't, why do I need to listen to this? Well, let me just give you a simple definition. Leadership is just responsibility. If you have responsibility in life, you're a leader. If you have children at home, you're a leader. If you have a spouse, you're a leader. If you have a job, you're a leader. We have responsibility everywhere we go. If you are a believer in Christ, you have a responsibility to care for the disenfranchised. You have a responsibility to make disciples. You have a responsibility to preach the gospel. So therefore, we are all qualified to now be leaders. The question is, what kind of leader will we be? So let's just look at this story of what is taking place, and and I'll, I'll kind of put it in a modern context to help us. But Peter and John are on their way to the temple to pray. Now, this is the the birth of the early church. Uh, Jesus has ascended. The Holy Spirit has come, and there were thousands added to their number. The the believers are all in unison. They're in one accord. They're selling their possessions. They're saying, man, we want to be unified in this, and it's a beautiful thing, and we see that they are on their way to go to the temple to pray. We're seeing this first miracle, actually, is the first miracle recorded uh, after uh, what happens in Acts chapter 2 and the Holy Spirit coming. And so the church is in a beautiful place, but there's opposition, obviously. There's the Jewish leaders and all those who have rejected Jesus Christ. And so they're on their way, and it says that they are at the gate called Beautiful. Now, if you were to understand how the temple was constructed, there would be nine entrances and This gate was unique in that all the others were made out of gold, but this one was made out of Corinthian bronze. And the reason why it was called the gate called beautiful is because that bronze over time with weathering and being exposed to the air, it would actually have this really beautiful uh, array of colors on it because of the wear and tear that would happen to that gate. And so at this gate called beautiful, there is brokenness. There is a man there who is dealing with some hard things. He's dealing with some struggle. And the way I see it like this is that man's situation is ugly. And there's this tension of he's he's having an ugly situation, but in a place that should be called beautiful. See, it's hard for me and sometimes for you uh, to digest that. Like we can deal with like, that's an ugly place, an ugly situation where ugly things happen. And we can kind of reconcile that in our minds a little bit easier. But when we're saying that's an ugly situation in a beautiful place, wait, wait, hold on. I thought they said it was a beautiful place. Why is there ugly happening? But this is the dissonance that that man is living in. And in fact, I think this is where a lot of believers are living in. 
They come to church and they hear the Pastor Brandon and the worship team singing out a song called The Good News and how God loves them. And, and they hear about the beauty of God through the word, but yet they feel like in their life it's an ugly situation. But thank God there's some new supernatural leaders who decided to go to the house of God and pray that day. So they are going through this ugly situation to the gate called Beautiful to see about a man's situation, to see about what he is going through. See, now here's the difference. This, what can happen with us is that we think that the man was isolated or lonely or that he didn't have people in his life, but he actually had somebody to carry him to the temple every day. But here's the difference between having a supernatural leader and a natural leader in your life. See, natural leaders can only carry you to outside the temple, but supernatural leaders can pull you inside the temple. So you might have people in your life, you say, no, pastor, I'm good. I got people in my life who care about me. But if they can only get you outside of the house of God and not inside of the house of God, are they really a supernatural leader? In other words, imagine as you came into church today, there was a man who was bound to a mat who sat right outside those doors. And every single Sunday, you saw him sitting there and he was asking you for money. And maybe you gave him some money. Maybe you said, I don't have any money, but I, I at least looked at him. Or maybe you ignored him completely. You wouldn't even look at his situation. And we have to ask ourselves, is anyone going to actually bring him in? Does anyone have the power to say, man, you need to get up and you need to come into the temple. You need to come into the house of God. Natural leaders carry you outside the temple because they're only operating on their own strength. Supernatural leaders can pull you into the temple because they're operating with the partnership of the Holy Spirit. Speaking of partnerships, we quickly see this beautiful partnership with Peter and John. Now, if you study the disciples, you'll only see Peter and John together by themselves four times in the Bible. But this is one of those times. We're seeing the beauty of who it is that we are walking with. Who's your partnership today? Jesus modeled this for us, even with the inner three. Yes, he had the disciples, but he got real, real when it was only Peter, James, and John. He understood the need for partnership. He sent out the laborers to go out in two by two. He sent them out as partners. And so it's very important that we are in the right partnerships. D.L. Moody said it this way, if God is your partner, make your plans big. If you are partnering with God, you better have some big plans because we serve a big God. So the supernatural leader has key Kingdom partnerships. I'm going to give them to you. The first one is this. A, a, the supernatural leader has a key partnership with God. You cannot be a leader for God and neglect your relationship with God. You have to have partnership with God and the Holy Spirit if you're going to be a supernatural leader. Secondly, you have to have a partnership with spiritual community, the church, the people in the church. This is why it's so important that we talk about going small and getting plugged into a small group or, or walking with people in discipleship or having a Bible study with people. It's important that we are partnering with other believers. There should be no lone wolves in the kingdom. Thirdly is this, if you're married, then you should have a partnership with your spouse. You should have a partnership with your spouse with the things that you're doing for God. Don't compartmentalize your spirituality with who you are married to. Don't compartmentalize it. You're having a partnership with them as you have a partnership with God. Fourthly is if you have children, that is a key kingdom partnership to leverage your relationship with your children. Maybe the way God is using your season of life of having little kids is that when you go to the park and they're playing on the swing, you get to talk to their parent as their little kids on the swing too. You're partnering with your children. Lastly is you got to have friends. Supernatural leaders got friends in their life who don't care that they're a leader. There are people in their life who are like, yeah, you got a title, so what? I know you, and I love you despite I know you. I love you, and I care about you, and I'm going to encourage you when you're down, and I'm going to humble you when you're getting a little too high. It's important that we would have kingdom friendships, kingdom partnerships in our lives. So Peter and John got the right partnership. They're on their way to the temple, and they encounter a lame man. They encounter a man that the Bible says has been in this condition since he was born. Can you imagine dealing with some kind of chronic illness for your whole life and the weight that that would have on you? Just the agony, the stress, the pain of that, the frustration of that. They stumble upon a man's life that he has been bound, unable to walk, unable to carry himself his entire life. But there is some things that this man does has. He, have, he has his mind. He's able to articulate things and talk to them. 
He has the ability to speak. He has some community of people. Now, we might think, oh, that's great. He's got people in his life. No, I think he just had some enablers in his life. You know, he had people who were okay seeing him go to the same situation day after day after day after day after day. He had enablers in his life who were, who were cool carrying him somewhere, but they're not going to take him to the place he needs to be, just the place that's convenient for them. But he had this weakness with his ankles and his feet. And we know that because when he was restored and healed, that's what got strength, his ankles and his feet. And oftentimes we can be like this lame man and that in fact we think, well, I got this part of my life figured out. I got this, life going, this part of my life going really well and I read my Bible and I go to church every Sunday and I do this. But we can have one area in our life that can still lead us to paralysis, that could still lead us to being crippled. We can't just say, well, let me just examine my role real quick because this is what we do. And we, oh, my life ain't as bad as that person. I'm doing better than them. I'm more disciplined than them. Oh, sister so-and-so ain't been to church for a while. I ain't, she don't even come to revival nights. Is she really saved? And we say, oh, I'm good. But the truth is, it can only be one area of your life that is the thing that is holding you back to the fullness that God's had. That's why it's so important that we're doing this digital fast. And can I tell you, maturity is not needing other people to tell us to do something. Now, it's a beautiful thing to have the community for us to say, hey, we're going to do this fast together. But we're doing a digital fast. But allow the Lord to still speak to you because he might say, son, daughter, I also want you to give this thing up. I also want you to no longer hold on to this thing. I also want you to give space in this area so that I can speak to you here. So we have to understand that it's important that we don't just check a box and think, well, I'm good because I, I looked at what other people are doing instead of saying, God, what is it you want to do in my life? What is it you want to say to me during this fast? Please hear me during this 40-day fast. Don't get left behind. Don't get left at the train station. A train is taken off. No, I'm not just talking about the fast. In real life church, a, ta a train is taking off. God is doing things. Things are happening. Things are moving. And we had our highest attendance uh, last Sunday ever, maybe almost 1,400 people in, just in person. Like God is moving. The train is departing. I would hate for you to come back after this fast and you still in the same spot and everyone else is at the next stop. Like really give God the space to speak to you, to help you. You might have all these things figured out and checked off, but you lack discipline with that little brick that we carry in our pockets. Use this opportunity for God to get a hold of you and to help us to grow and to mature and to become more disciplined. So there's a lame man. Let me give us a definition of this, of what it is to be lame. In the natural, the physical, lame person is a person who is crippled or disabled in a lamb. They are injured in such a way that they lack strength and proper function. But I thought I would give us the spiritual application as well. A spiritually lame person can see and hear the truth of God and may even confess it, but is paralyzed from acting on it or applying it in their life. So you might not have a physical ailment today, but do you have a spiritual ailment that's leaving you bound and lame in paralysis, unable to actually apply what God wants for your life. I say it this way, we got a lame man sitting outside of a lame church because the synagogue at this time were the leaders of religion who were rejecting Christ. They just had him crucified. Peter and John were not going into a, a, a great prayer meeting where everyone was gonna welcome their message. No, they were going into a hostile territory. They were going into a place with people who wanted to kill and did, successfully did, kill their savior. And so we have to understand lame leaders... Lame leadership leaves people lame, while supernatural leadership leaves people to surrendered living. Lame leadership. When we, 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 cannot, we cannot say, well, you know, he, he's outside the temple and these people, are, they don't have what he needs. They can't give him what he needs to get well. It wasn't until a supernatural leader came that had what he needed to be able to get up and to be able to walk and to be able to go into the temple. Lame leadership leaves people lame. But supernatural leadership leads people to surrendered living. There's this phrase that's been going around the last 15 years, maybe five to 10 years, maybe not 15, but it's just like caught so much steam and, and uh, it's just so popular now. And that is the phrase church hurt. Come on, how many of y'all heard church hurt? Some of y'all might've used that phrase, I'm church hurt. It's like an epidemic, you know, it's like COVID all over again, where it's just like everyone's getting contagious with church hurt. And they got every reason, this, that, and the third, why they should not go to church or participate in church, or they can all these terrible things to say, can I tell you, I don't think people are actually church hurt. I think you're just leadership hurt. I think your leader hurt. 
I think you were genuinely hurt by a leader. You were genuinely hurt by a person who was supposed to represent God. But by saying and claiming your new identity as church hurt, what you are actually doing is you are allowing the enemy to put you in the perfect position of isolation of saying, I don't need spiritual leadership in my life. I don't need people I'm surrendered to in my life. I am the judge, jury, and and the prosecutor. I am the final say. That's exactly where the enemy wants you because he knows he's got you duped. He wants you to not think that there's a value in having leadership in your life. He wants you to think that there's not a value in having people who give you wise counsel, who speak into your life, who you are submitted to. I know, I use the S word. But if we're gonna do so responsibly, we can't be lame leaders. We have to be supernatural leaders, not leaders that would perpetuate people becoming hurt, but leaders who would lead people in healthy, integrous relationships, people who would lead people by the hand. Let me just tell you this again, if you're still like, well, I'm not a leader, I don't see myself as a leader, lame believers will become lame leaders. If you are a lame believer, and yes, I'm using the word lame, like that's lame, you are a lame believer, I'm using it in both contexts. If you got any complaints, you can email Pastor Jesse Armstrong, that's Jesse A at rlcsac.com. Lame believers will become lame leaders. If we don't deal with our stuff in the developmental phase of our walk with God, we will, everyone else will have to pay for it when we're in a position of leadership. Everyone else will have to pay for all the mistakes because we were unwilling to get healthy or allow the Lord to do the work he wanted to do in our life. So I've come up with a list. A friend of mine sent this to me. I changed the title a little bit, but I think it's so fitting. Signs you are becoming a lame Christian. If you don't like the word lame, you can put lukewarm on there. Here we go. You can take a picture of this so you have it for later. I'm not, I don't have time to go through all of them. Number one, signs you're becoming a lame leader. You have a lack of zeal. You've lost your zeal for God and the things of God. Number two, you neglect reading your Bible and prayer. Sometimes it really is that simple of you are, you are stuck and you are in a hurdle and someone's asked you for the umpteenth time, are you reading your Bible? Well, no. Okay, let's start there compromising with sin. Number three, you are now just telling yourself, you're justifying yourself. Well, it's just a little bit. It's okay. It's not a lot. It's just a little bit. It's not too much. Like I got it under control. I could stop whenever I want to stop. You're compromising with sin. You're getting ready to become a lame Christian. Number four, there's no spiritual fruit to your life. Jesus says that we should judge a tree by its fruit. The Bible says that God would want us to bear fruit and that we would have fruit that would remain. We are called to be fruitful people. If there's no fruit in our lives, there's something going on. Number five, you're isolated from church community. You're not a part of any type of a faith-based community. I'm not saying just church on a Sunday because you could be out of community and still come to church on Sunday. I'm talking about integrated into the life of other believers. That like your people you go to eat lunch with, like the people you hang out with, the people you do fun activities with and play sports with are believers. You're integrated or you're, I'm sorry, you're opposite. You're isolated from church community is a big warning sign. Number five, no concern for the lost. You have no concern for the lost. You can go out every single day and you can see horrible, tragic things and there's nothing that even stirs your heart. You can hear the news of a report of something that happened And you're like, yeah, sounds about right. Go to the next show. Having a a response that your heart is moved, your heart is grieved at seeing the enemy have his way in other people's lives is a sign of being close and connected to the vine. It's a sign that we we are staying close to the heart of Jesus because we want our heart to echo his heart and his heart cares for the broken. His heart cares for the marginalized. His heart cares for those who have been ostracized. Number seven, a greater desire for self-sufficiency. Now, this one is interesting, um, you know, because we get it confused in our culture. We call it, man, that person's just a hustler. They're just a go-getter. They're just driven. They have ambition. No, you might just be trying to be self-sufficient so that you can go and get everything you want and you don't need God anymore. Self-sufficiency can be a sign or, or I don't need anybody in my life. Really? You don't need people in your life? That's a warning sign you're becoming a lame Christian. Number eight, indifference to suffering. Number nine, no desire for spiritual growth. Are you in a position where you could be like, man, I, I don't read my Bible. You can admit something. 
I'm just using that as an example, but you're like, but I don't wanna do anything about it. Like there's, there's no actual desire to want to grow, to want to be different. You know, I love it when Jesus heals another man, he asks him the question, do you actually wanna be made well, right? We have to actually have the desire to want to partner with the Holy Spirit in this. And lastly is you're starting to see an uptick or an increase in materialism and becoming more like the world. Come on, we gotta tell the truth. Has anyone ever had a bad day? I mean, a bad day. And you thought, you know what I need to do? I need to go hit up the mall. I'm gonna go buy these new shoes. I'm gonna get these new clothes. For me, it's not with clothes as much. It's like a steak. I'm like, what's, where's the good? Where is the steakhouse at? I'm like, yes, put the mushrooms and onions on. Put all of it on there. I want the whole thing. It's been a hard day. And what do we tell ourselves? I deserve it. When there is an increase for a desire for material things in our heart, that is a warning sign. That's the, the red light is flashing. It's telling us that there's something probably a little off that needs to be adjusted, and we're trying to compensate with things. Materialism can be a warning sign that we're becoming a lame Christian. Let me tell you, if this list describes you today, you need to hear something very importantly. Do not feel called out and get offended. Feel that God is calling you up and wants to help you change. Do not let offense, do not let me as a person who is broken, don't let my tone or what I look like or whatever be something that would cause you to be offended, but rather take this opportunity to know that this is God wanting to call you up, not call you out. He wants to pull you up, not pull you out. He wants to bring you closer to him, not push you further away from him. So if there's any level of conviction that the Holy Spirit is giving you, you should praise God because that means he loves you. That means he cares for you. That means your heart is not a heart of stone, but it is a heart of flesh. Conviction from God is a good thing. It's how he orchestrated it to help us to know, hey, son or daughter, I just need to, we got to bring this in here. It's getting a little out of hand. And he'll bring people in your life. He'll bring leaders in your life to help echo that same thing. So use this digital fast as a time to prioritize the right stuff. What are the things you gotta, you gotta give up? What are the things you gotta be able to say, hey, I, I can't do that anymore? You know, for some of you, it might be social media. I said it in the first service, and I'm gonna say it again, because clearly these people, you might have to give up whatever favorite game you like to play on your phone. Clash of Clans gotta go. Candy Crush gotta go. I don't know if that's still the game. That might be, I don't know. I know for me, chess has got to go. My wife's back there like, yes, I love to play chess. I play chess all day. You love to play chess too. Yeah, we're going to have to play after the fast, but you know what I'm saying? I'm like, man, I, I, I'm like, I try to justify it like I'm increasing my intellect. No, I'm not. I'm spending time on my phone playing chess. I don't know what it is for you, but what do you got to give up? What do you have to Get out of your life so that you don't become a lame Christian, so that you don't become a lame leader, so that people who are actually lame are stuck there because of it. Like, what is that thing? And asking the Lord to truly help us. Okay, now actually, I'm gonna get to the actual message. Here we go. Uh, what is the DNA blueprint of a supernatural leader? That's what we came here to do. How can I be a supernatural leader? I need a blueprint. I need a framework. I need to understand. Peter is showing us some things. Let's glean from them. The first thing, if we are going to be a supernatural leader that we should possess, is that supernatural leaders don't sprint to prayer. They walk with it every day. They don't sprint to prayer. They walk with it every day. Meaning, they don't have a crisis and say, ah, I got to pray. But instead, sorry, Rudy, they have a consistent prayer time every day. They have a consistent conversation with God every day. Now, we've all had something bad happen, and we text all the saints, and we're like, you need to pray, you need to pray, you need to pray. And praise God for those people. But we cannot people who just sprint to prayer when the urgency comes, but we should be people that walk with prayer daily, every day a part of our lives. Every day. Peter and John were going to prayer at 3 p.m. I told you it's very important that they're going to prayer at 3 p.m. You guys, this was not Easter Sunday. This was not Christmas this was not the little children's recital that they were gonna perform at church. It was a regular, normal day at 3 p.m. See, we often are trying to look for the supernatural and special events, but the supernatural is normally in the ordinary. It was an ordinary day where they decided to remain faithful and go to pray at 3 p.m. Now, Jewish custom would be that there was three prayer times. They would have a prayer time in the morning. They would have a prayer time at 3 p.m., both of which they would need to bring a sacrifice. And then they'd have a prayer time in the evening. How many of you know this lame man is praising God 
that Peter and John decided to come to church at 3 p.m. I wonder how many people would show up if we decided to have church at 3 p.m. Seriously. It was just an ordinary day in the middle of the day, but they were committed to going to prayer. Are you in love with the consistent, mundane, regular things? Because supernatural leaders are. The consistency of, it hasn't changed yet, but I'm still going to go to church today. I'm still believing God for it. I'm going to go to my small group. I'm still believing God for it. I'm going to go serve in the outreach at Joey's Food Locker. Whatever it might be, it's just consistently mundane thing. God ain't really speaking to me. I'm going to still read the Bible today. I'm not hearing nothing. I'm going to still press in and believe that God is going to do something. So you might find yourself and say, man, I want to see God use my life. I hear this all the time. I want to be a leader. I want to be used by God. But because your team is playing at 3 p.m., you choose your team over your Lord. If you can't do anything on Thursday night because, well, the game's on on Thursday night. And then you can't do anything on Monday night well because the game's on on Monday night. And then Sunday morning from when the game starts to when the game's end, you can't do anything because the game is on. Can I tell you, you have a problem. It's a problem. I'm not anti-sports. I love sports. I played sports. But if you make your calendar based on what is the sports calendar, you are so far off. If you are saying yes and no to, uh, to being and fellowshipping with believers, if you're saying yes and no to what church service, if you're going to go to church or not because of that, you got to check your heart. You got to say, what's, what's really more important to me? Is it my idol or is it my God? Because sports, not just sports, a lot of things, I'm using that because football starts next week, can be really hard. And we, I mean, so many of us, especially the staff, we can all talk to people just saying like, yeah, sorry, I can't. The game's coming on. For real? Like, did he save you? Did he forgive you of your sins? This ain't a pun. This isn't trying to guilt people to serve. I'm not talking about serving. I'm just talking about worshiping. Like, did he not forgive you of your sins and give you eternal life? But because the Lakers are playing, sorry, Taylor, you ain't going to go? Because the 49ers got a game, you're not going to go? You're going to say no to people made in the image of God that loved you and were there with you through all these seasons because who knows is on the TV? Like, we got to get this recalibrated. I'm not going to say get it right. We got to get it recalibrated. I'll never forget, not here because this would never happen here, but Chelsea and I were at another church and we had a very, very key volunteer. Like if homegirl didn't show up, I was that much closer to having to lead worship because we had a very thin bench and that would have been a problem. And I remember she came to me, she gave me notice, but she still came to me and she said, hey, pastor, I just want you to know, I can't, I can't serve on the worship team for like the next two months, three months. And I was like, oh no, what are we going to do? You know, I'm freaking out in my mind. And I'm like, are you burnt out? Do you feel like you need rest? And she's like, oh, no, uh, you know, uh, Johnny is, he's got soccer and baseball. And so I got to go to all the practices. So I can't do rehearsals. And then he has games on all Sundays. So I can't sing on Sundays. I was like, dang, you're not going to go to church for three months because little Johnny and Timmy got soccer and baseball and he's five years old. What is that showing your kid of what's the priority? Now hear me, I'm not against little leagues and all, I'm not against kids sports. I played all that. I'm not against all that. But what I'm saying is, if we allow these things, we're teaching our kids something. We're showing them what's the priority. Like your, your, your five-year-old soccer practice is more important than being in the house of the Lord with God's people. I'm not trying to be legalistic about this. I'm trying to cause you to have a little bit of discomfort so that you would ask the Lord, what does he want for you to do for your family? This last couple of weeks uh, have been hard for us and our family, and um, so our kids haven't been able to go to church uh, because they just haven't been able to go to church. And so our, our oldest son, Apollo, uh, grandma was getting him up and he was asking grandma, like he normally does, ask every morning, what's, what's today today? What's today? What's today? And she's like, well, it's Sunday. He's like, no, it's not. And, she, and she's like, no, it's Sunday. He's like, no, it's not because we go to church on Sunday. See, kids know and they pick up very quickly what's important to us. And so we want to make sure that we don't just sprint to the prayer place, but that we walk with it every day. That was just point one. Here we go. Let me keep moving. Supernatural leaders, let me just say, I forgot to say this, are ones who consistently do the ordinary thing. They consistently do the ordinary thing. Their strength, your second one, is 
in Jesus' name, not their own name. Their strength of a supernatural leader is in Jesus' name, not in their own name. A supernatural leader understands their name holds no weight. Only the name of Jesus holds weight. A key sign to know if a supernatural leader is supernatural, is Jesus the hero in their story or are they the hero in their story? Moving on. The supernatural leader, they only give what they have faithfully lived. Peter and John are asked for money and he tells them, I can't give you what I do not have, but what I do have, I say in the name of Jesus, get up. He is giving something that he has. He has authority that has been given through Jesus. He is giving what he has lived and experienced himself, that Jesus can do a restorative and redemptive work in your life. The temptation for young leaders, old leaders, any leader is to try to give something that you have not lived. You cannot give what you have not lived, and you cannot live what you have not learned. That is wisdom's order. You have to learn something, apply it to your life before you could tell somebody else to do it. So supernatural leaders, they only give what they have faithfully lived. They do not compare to what other people's gifts are and talents are. They're saying, this is what God has given me. This is what I give you. I know that person can give you that. I can't give you that. I can give you encouragement because that's what God has given me. I can give you compassion because that's what God has given me. I can give you wisdom because that is what God has, been, God has given me. It's about giving what God has given to us. They don't bypass the broken. They behold it. Supernatural leaders don't just blow past people's brokenness and are not changed by it. In fact, they will stop and pause and look at what is going on in that person's life. This man asked them for money. And Peter's response is, hey, 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 look at me. He was on autopilot. He was living life like just in shame probably. Like, hey, you got anything? You got anything? Not even looking at people probably because people have disregarded him so long he doesn't even look up anymore. But Peter said, hey, look at me. I'm looking at you. I see your mess. I see the hardship. I see the stink. I see the struggle. But I'm here because I care. And I know that Jesus can take broken things and make it beautiful. And I know Jesus can take ugly things and restore it and make it brand new. I, like he is, he is saying, I see your brokenness. I'm taking it all in and I'm here for it. And I'm here with you through that. Supernatural leaders don't see people's brokenness and say, ooh, that's, that's too messy. Or they don't walk up to the situation and just be like, oh man, and then keep walking but they're willing to behold it. They're willing to look at what other people have going on in their life. Supernatural leaders, they lead by the hand and not from behind a desk. They don't lead back here. Hey, you know, you should do that better. And, and Lisa, can we make sure that we get this fixed over here? And, and you really didn't clean that too well over there, Mike. Can you make sure you handle that? That's not a supernatural leader. A supernatural leader says, oh, no, no, no. You, you've been on the ground? How long? Okay, tell me about your story. Who hurt you? Who is the person that, oh man, let me tell you about what God can do in your life. Let me grab you by the hand. You trying to get in there? Let me take you there with me. Let me let you come with me. Let me hold on to you so that you can get your strength back. Let me lead you by the hand. Let me walk with you by the hand. They don't walk and say, ooh, that, that's, you know what you need to do is you need to get your life right. What you need to do is you need to start praying to Jesus. What you need to do is you need to stop doing that. They say, no, 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 I'm gonna get in here where you're at and I'm gonna grab you by the hand and I'm gonna pull you out of that and now we're gonna walk together into the newness that God has what a supernatural leader does. Man, I'm running out of time. Here we go. The last thing, they still preach repentance of sin. The message of repentance of sin is still for today. Can I tell somebody? We can't just love on people and tell them God is love and, and everyone loves you. You still got to get to the place where you're telling them that repentance is needed for sin. Now, that shouldn't be your first conversation with them. You should tell them the good news before they got to hear the bad news. But the reality is we got to tell people you need to repent for the sin that's in your life. A supernatural leader is not scared to point that out. It's not scared to say, you know what? You know, I love you. I've been walking with you. We've been talking for about five weeks. Hey, when are you going to start doing this? When are you going to put that aside? It's time to repent for your behavior. You got pride in your life. You got to stop lying at work. You got to stop whatever, fill in the blank. A supernatural leader preaches repentance. The crowd is coming. They see the miracle. They're in amazement. They're in awe and wonder. And Peter does not hesitate. He uses the opportunity to say, let me tell all you Israelites in here that rejected Jesus, that had him hung on a cross, you need to repent of your sin so that you can encounter the refreshing of God. 
We have to have repentance of sin as part of our leadership tool belt, as part of what we do when we're ministering to people and with people. See, they were all amazed. And sometimes I think that's what we contend for. We say, God, I just wanna be amazed by you. God, I just wanna be blown away by you. God, I just wanna be shocked by you. But we really should say, God, I just wanna be surrendered to you. The miracle was so that the message could go forth, not the other way around. The miracle is so that people's hearts would be opened up to hear, hey, you know what? You gotta repent for that sin. But Jesus paid the price for that sin. This is good news. Let me just paraphrase. Peter would go on. They would get upset at what he was saying. The religious leaders would come and would arrest him and John, and they would question him about what he was doing, and they told him this. They told him, you are not to go out and preach the gospel anymore and telling people about Jesus. And I love what he says in Acts chapter 4, verse 19. One day I'm just praying God gives me like the perfect moment to say this, but this is what he says. Peter and John replied to him, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to listen to him? You be the judge. Mike, drop. Like, what do you want me to do? Would you rather I listen to you or listen to what God says? Go ahead and tell me. Supernatural leaders listen to the Lord, not to the crowd. Supernatural leaders listen to the Lord, not to what the crowd is saying. It's not about all the noise of what other people are doing. This is why the digital fast is so important. What you're doing is you're canceling out the crowd so that you can hear from the Lord. You're reducing all the different avenues that the world has access to your mind and to your heart. You're shutting all the doors and windows and saying, okay, God, you're the only one. Now who can download something into my spirit? Supernatural leaders listen to the Lord, not to the crowd. I don't know about you, but I want to learn from the life of Peter. I want to be able to apply this to my life. But the reality is we can't be a supernatural leader until we've been a, a follower we can't be a follower until we enter into a relationship. Earlier today, we took communion, which is the example and the embodiment of entering into a covenant with God. It's us symbolically remembering the covenant God made with us by saying, hey, take up this bread. My body was broken for you. My blood was shed so that you can have the remission of your sins. That is what we're talking about right now in this moment. Maybe you're here today and you've been leader hurt and it's led you spiraling down a hill. It's led you running away from God. Or maybe you're just in here today and you don't have a relationship with God. But you feel a knocking on your heart. You feel God pressing upon your heart and you wanna enter into that relationship. I wanna give you an opportunity. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads? You're here today, very quickly. You wanna accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Would you just lift your hand so I know who I'm praying for? We had four people in the first service give their, hands, or give their life to Jesus. Thank you, I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you, my brother. Anybody else? Thank you, I see that hand. Anybody else? Thank you. I see that hand. You want to give your life to Jesus. Thank you. I see that hand. Our ushers are going to be coming by. They're going to place something in your hand. Anybody else want to join these? Thank you. I see that hand right here. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you. There's a sister right here. This is what we're going to do. You can open your eyes. We're going to pray this prayer together. It's up here on the screen. We're going to pray this as a family, and I'm going to give you a few instructions. We can, uh, we're going to pray this on the count of three. Here we go. One, two, three. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. Right now, I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust you and follow you from this day forward. I confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we celebrate with those who put their faith in Jesus today? Hallelujah. If you made that decision... We celebrate with you. We want to place something in your hand. We have a team in the back of the sanctuary with the I Have Decided banner. They would love to connect with you, pray with you, and let you know about the next steps of what God has for your life. For the rest of us, can we all just stand to our feet this, uh, this morning here as we conclude? I want to pray for you. Our prayer team is going to be making their way down to the altar now. Our worship team is going to come out and lead us. But I'm just going to pray a general prayer for us that if you're here today, you're getting ready for this fast, maybe the Lord's been still trying to press upon you what it is and how you should participate. Here's the reality. This world, our community, where God has you working, where your children go to school, all of these places need supernatural leaders. And God has revealed himself to us so that we can grow and mature and we can be those supernatural leaders in our community, in our neighborhoods, maybe even just on your block. 
maybe just in your apartment complex. He's positioned you there to be a supernatural leader, to carry the DNA of the Holy Spirit that people would encounter the love of God. And so if you need prayer for any kind, you can come down for prayer for that. But I'm gonna pray for all of us that God would truly move in us anything that needs to be removed, he'd remove it, but that he would fan into flame what he has placed inside of us for this season. Lord, we thank you that you are good. We thank you that you are faithful despite storms and seasons, God. You never waver. Lord, I pray for this room and everyone under the sound of my voice that you would help us, God, to learn from the life of Peter, but that you would help us even more to apply that knowledge to our lives, that we would not live and operate out of the natural, but the supernatural, that we would have an understanding that we are living under an open heaven, that you are our source, God. And so, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, you would convict us, but you would also encourage us. You would challenge us, but you would give us strength. You would reveal to us and you would give us the plans for our lives and the way that you are guiding and leading us, God. Cover us, help us, we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, church family. If you need- Hey everybody, I wanna take a moment again and say thank you for joining us. Real Life Church's mission is to engage real life, embrace real people, and encounter the real God. We want you to know that you are a part of that mission. We also want to make sure that you know about the best way to keep in the know about all things Real Life Church, and that is through our Church Center app. Through this app, you can give, check out groups, look at our events, and even update your profile information. We'd also like to take a moment and thank all of our generous givers. Through your gift, we are able to make a difference for God's kingdom in our community and beyond. There are a couple different ways that you can give virtually, through our Church Center app, via our website at rlcsac.com, or text to give. Text the word give and the amount to 84321. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can stay up to date and encouraged with the latest message. We'd also love to connect with you on our other social media channels where we share everything real life. So see you next time.